Welcome back. So in this uh, lecture video or YouTube tutorial, whatever you want to call it, we're going to be talking about functions. Now, functions uh, are basically everywhere all around us. And you probably are using functions without even knowing it. For example, uh, we could say height. All right, height is a function of age. All right, we can even say something along the lines of uh, your paycheck, okay, is a function of time. And what functions really help us to do is uh, functions allow us to uh, predict things which is super, super, super important. I mean, if you think about it, <clears throat> if you can figure out a way to predict something, then in essence, you're kind of basically uh, seeing into the future. All right. So let's go ahead and we're going to start off with the actual math definition of a function. Okay. So let me, let me write this out here. So here's our definition here. A function is a rule that assigns to each element x in a set A exactly one element called f of x in set B. Now, traditionally, back in <clears throat> uh, intermediate algebra or uh, basic algebra course, uh, you learn some special words for these sets. So, like, for example, here, we call, we call the element in set A, that's set A we call the domain. Okay, and we also call this the independent variable. Okay, now that exactly one element called f of x in set B, well, we would call this set the range, and then this would be called our dependent variable. All right. Now, an easy way to visualize what a function is, you could think of it as a calculator. Okay, so a function acts like a calculator. Or sometimes if you're old school, you might have heard it referred to as a function machine. Okay, so... The first thing that we're going to do here is we're going to uh, we're going to evaluate a function and we're and then we're going to draw what we have to kind of give you a visual representation. All right, so let's look at this function right here. We're going to evaluate this function f of x equals x to the second minus x minus six four f of negative 1, and f of 0, okay? Now, you heard me read this, but I'm going to go ahead and say it again. This is read either f of x, f at x, or f evaluated at x. They all mean the same exact thing, okay? Now, this x squared minus x minus 6, that's that rule that the definition above was talking about. Off to the right-hand side, where we have f of 1, or I'm sorry, f of negative 1 and then f of 0. The f of negative 1 and the f of 0 are my x values, okay? They're going to be the independent variable. I have no control over those numbers. What I want to know is... If I were to substitute negative 1 or 0 in for the variable x into my rule, what would the function f of x give me? So like I said, if we think about this as like a function machine or a calculator, and I'm going to show you using the machine and the calculator, because I know some of us have like a TI-80 whatever, and I'm going to show you how to use that. So the quickest and easiest way I can describe this is just by drawing like this big box here. All right, and this big box represents f of x. That's the machine. 
Now, here's what we know. We know f of x is defined by the rule x squared minus x minus 6. But notice, I just put parentheses where the x's, where the x's were. So then, I substitute in negative 1. And over here, like on the right-hand side, is a little switch. Just a little switch. And what you would do is you would press the button, and the number 1 would fall into these spots here. So you would evaluate negative 1, negative 1. And what we would get as an output would be, uh, let's see here. Well, this would be, and I'm going to do the math underneath. Negative 1 to the second power is positive 1 plus 1 minus 6. Or 2 minus 6 would be negative 4. So what we say is f of negative 1 equals negative 4. Now, I, you know what? I'm going to wait for that. I was going to do something, but we're going to wait for it. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to come in. We're going to erase the negative 1 because what we want to evaluate now is f of 0. So I put a 0 on the conveyor belt, and I turn it on. 0 goes into the va variable's x's. <clears throat> and then the function crunches the numbers, and you get negative 6. So underneath, I'm going to put f of 0 equals negative 6. Now, like I said, many of you want to do this in your calculator, and I definitely encourage that. Really do, because you know you could easily make a mental math mistake uh because we're to the point now where it's like we kind of know how to do a lot of this stuff like in our heads but it's always nice to have a little tool that will uh prevent you from making those little mistakes so uh here i have uh my calculator <clears throat> sorry that's not my calculator here we go there's the calculator and uh this is exactly like a function machine so if you notice in the in the uh Second column, second button down, you have this button that says X, T, theta, and letter N, okay? And uh, anytime you hit this button in the second column, second row, it's just going to say letter X unless you change the calculator mode, which we're never going to do. But just know that you can actually use the variable X. So what we're going to tell this calculator here is we're going to say, okay, calculator, we're going to take negative 1. We're going to hit this button, which is directly above the on button. Okay, it's called STO. So we're going to hit click on that, and then we're going to store it in for X and hit enter. So now the calculator knows anytime you hit the variable X, it's going to substitute in negative 1. So what we can do is just type out our function. So the function that we had was X to the second power minus X minus 6 and hit enter. And notice that the calculator spits out negative 4. We could do the same exact thing with 0. So watch this. I'm going to hit 0, store into x, hit enter. <clears throat> and then if you look right above the enter button in blue, you see how it says entry? Now on your calculator, if you're not using like the TI-84+, TI plus, it, it may be a different color, but it's always above the enter button. Okay? You're going to hit second enter, second enter. Enter, and that's just like hitting backspace. Notice we get the function again, x squared minus x minus 6, except you said calculator store 0 in for x. So now when I hit enter, it's going to say negative 6. Okay? So that's a quick, easy way to kind of use your calculator to your advantage. All right? So if you need to see it again, just go ahead, rewind the video, and then you can come back. So now back onto this, okay? This is the first thing was... Okay, we went ahead, we evaluated. Now, let's see what this looks like in a picture. Okay? So, in red, I'm going to draw what we call a set. And this set is going to have a very special name. It's going to call the domain. And I'm going to substitute in my values, negative 1 and 0. Okay? Now, on the right-hand side is going to be another set. And this is going to be called the range. All right, and these are my output values or my dependent values. And we found those to be negative 4 and negative 6, respectively. If I were to draw an arrow and connect them, this arrow represents the rule x squared minus x minus 6. Now, the key to understanding what a, what a function is visually 
is the fact that when you look at this picture here, this number one, which I'm going to go ahead and put a red box around it, this negative one only points to exactly one y value. And that is what makes this a function. Notice that the negative one and the zero only point to one specific value. Okay. That is unbelievably important because if you think about it, what if you were taking a test and you got your calculator out? All right. And I'm just going to just draw like a little calculator picture right here. All right. What if you got your calculator out and uh, you hit, you know, uh, some number and you store it in the X and then you typed in X squared minus X minus six. You hit the enter button and the calculator said this. Negative two comma eight. Well, <clears throat> the first thing you should be thinking is which one of these values is correct? All right, because remember, this is a test and you want to make sure you get the answer correct. And if you put negative two comma eight, you have no idea which one of those answers is the, the actual correct one. All right. So what functions allow us to do is it allows us to predict something because we know and I'm going to scroll all the way back up because we know and this sentence right here is the most important sentence when it comes to functions. It assigns each element X exactly one element F of X in another set. We call that we call that uh, one. Uh, not, no, I'm sorry. That's not one to one. One to ones later. Oops, sorry. All right. So let's just move on here. Let's just move on. So remember, exactly one element in the second set. Now, we kind of already looked at how to evaluate a function. We looked at uh, domain and range. So what I want to do is kind of just do one more evaluation, okay? But, um, but we're going to get just a little bit more difficult, okay? So here's an example. We're going to evaluate f of x equals x squared plus 1 for f of negative 3, f of 0, and f of x plus h. Okay? So there are a couple ways to do this. You can, you can dive right in. All right, you can make your substitutions, or you can go ahead and you can write your function machine. What I'm going to do is I'm going to draw that function machine one more time because I really, really, really want to drive home what's happening here. All right, so remember, this is called f of x. And this function is extremely specialized because all it knows how to do is x to the second plus 1. Part A we want to evaluate f of negative three. So we throw negative three on here. Negative three, when we turn the machine on, negative three falls down to this spot and you get an output of 10. Okay, now we're gonna go ahead and do zero. So I throw zero on the machine. Turn the machine on, the zero falls right down in the X position and we get a one for the output. Okay. Now this last one is, it's not tricky. You just got to be really, really careful because see what we're putting onto the machine is X plus H. <clears throat> and we know when we turn the machine on X plus H will fall down in that position and the calculator will evaluate this. And the calculator knows that X plus the quantity of X plus H squared plus one is really the quantity X plus H times X plus H plus one. And then it knows to go ahead and simplify. So it's going to do uh, X times X, which is X squared X times H plus X times H plus H squared plus one. So what it spits out or what the output is, is x squared plus 2xh plus h squared plus 1. So part C 
this f of x plus h when the input is x plus h the output is x squared plus 2xh plus h squared plus 1 and I'm going to put a box around this because if you take calculus you will see this x plus h a lot all right so we also have what we call piecewise defined functions now piecewise defined functions are functions that are in keyword pieces all right so like here's a pretty straightforward one right here so we have c of x equals 20 if x is in between 0 and 2 or x to the second plus 8 if x is greater than or equal to 2 okay so <clears throat> If I ask you to evaluate f of 4, f of 0, and f of 2, well, what you need to just do is figure out which one of these pieces am I going to use. So. Once again, if you wanted to, you know, maybe I should have written this down here. If you wanted to, you could still draw a function machine. It's just now you have different pieces of this function machine. So watch this. So what's going to happen here is this. If your function... Is or if the if the number that you want to evaluate is in between zero and two, it's going to sort this automatically. So this is going to be twenty, or x squared plus eight. Now, <clears throat> and I'm going to write this in blue. So we go up this way. If x is less than or equal to zero but less than two and if x is greater than two or equal to two we go down there so if you think about this our first number is four four does not fit within that interval so it's going to come down here substitute into there you get four squared which is 16 and 16 plus eight 24. So off to the right here, I'll put a f of 4 equals 24. Now we're going to do part b, which is f of 0. So give me one sec. I just got to delete some stuff. So throw 0 on the uh, conveyor belt. <clears throat> now 0 is going to come up this way and over here. But notice there is nothing for you to substitute in. So no matter what. If your value is in between 0 and 2, excluding the number 2, this will always spit out 20, no matter what. So if x is 0, you get 20. If x is 1, you get 20. If x is 1.5, you get 20. If x is 1.9999999, you still get 20. Okay? And then finally, the last one here. Sorry, I messed up my... There we go. So finally, with this last one here, we substitute in 2. Now, 2 only applies to this down here, the greater than or equal to. So you could put a 2 right there, and your output is going to be 4 plus 8 is 12. So part C, F of 2, <clears throat> all right, equals 12. So, so far, we've been looking at regular functions, piecewise defined functions and if you notice everything just like kind of happened to work 
all right? These next group of functions that we're going to be looking at, it's not really a group. I mean, these are, these are just real things that you're going to encounter, all right? We're going to call this evaluating functions with conditions, okay? And what I mean by that is this. finding domain okay sometimes you need to be extremely careful about uh, the function you have and then you know how do you evaluate it so here's an example here we got our calculator again okay we're gonna clear it out all right and uh, let me see I think I had yeah I still had some stuff stored in there so we're just going to go ahead, and I think it would be clear all list. I'm not sure. It's been a while since I've done this, so let me hit the letter X. No, nope, it still says zero, which is fine. <clears throat> so here's the problem, all right? Let's say we had the function f of x equals 1 over x, okay? Now, 1 over x is a rational expression, all right? It's a, it's a fraction, and the thing is we know that x can be any number we want it to be except 0. Because when x equals 0, you get this error. You cannot divide by 0. So even though we start dealing with a lot of different types of functions, we got to be extremely careful. All right? Because not all x values... will work into the function. All right? And when we say this, what we're really talking about are restricted domains. All right? So just because you got a function, that doesn't necessarily imply that you could just pick any number you want. Okay? Now, sometimes it's really, really easy. Okay, sometimes it's really easy to see it, um, like in this example here. So in this example, we're going to say find the domain for f of x equals 4 over x plus 1. Okay? So the thing that we got to remember here is that whenever you have a variable in your denominator, so a variable in the denominator, all right, we got to be really, really careful because we don't want to put any numbers in there that's going to make the denominator zero. The easiest way to do that would be to find the contradictions. In other words, find the exceptions. Okay? So we know denominator cannot equal zero. Okay? Our denominator cannot equal zero. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our denominator and we're going to not equal it to zero. Okay? Now, I know this may look a little weird, but just pretend that that not equal to symbol is just an equal sign. And just solve for x. So if we subtracted one from both sides, we just found the restriction. In other words, we can use any value of x that we want. x cannot equal negative 1. And there are a couple ways to say this. So if we, I just write the word domain, I can say all real numbers, comma, x cannot equal 1. Oh, sorry, x cannot equal negative 1. That's one way. Another way would be set builder notation. x is such that x is a real number. However, x cannot equal 1. And then the last way 
Oh, let me write this here. Set builder notation. And then the last way we can do this is interval notation. Now, interval notation, it really helps to just kind of label like a graph here and just say, okay, there's an open dot at negative one, which means I'm not allowed to have negative one. I can shade everything to the left and everything to the right of that dot, but I can't have negative one. So the easy way to do this would be negative infinity all the way up to negative one with a parenthesis. That letter U stands for union, which means or one all the way up to positive infinity. And this is like I said, what we call interval notation. Okay, so there are multiple ways to do this. The key is to just read the directions. Make sure you're reading the parentheses because they'll tell you how they want the number. Okay, now we're going to do a couple more examples here. And each one of these examples highlights a very special case. So here's our next example. Find domain for f of x equals 1 over x to the third minus 4x. Okay? Now, remember, there is an infinite amount of numbers you can pick. However, we got to find the exceptions. All right? Find the exceptions. So the easiest way to do this is to understand what type of function are you given. This is a rational function. All right. We know rational functions, denominator cannot equal zero. So we're going to take our denominator. We're going to use the not equal to symbol. We're going to set it not equal to zero. And then we're just going to solve for X. Now, here I can clearly see I can factor out an X. All right. And I end up getting X squared minus four inside the parentheses, which is difference of squares. So X plus two times X minus two cannot equal zero. And what we found here is that X cannot equal zero. X cannot equal negative two. And X cannot equal positive two. So if I wrote this in set builder notation, x is such that x cannot equal 0. Actually, let's put it in order. x cannot equal negative 2. x cannot equal 0. And x cannot equal positive 2. So this is telling me I can use any number of x I want except negative 2, 0, and positive 2. And that is because my function will break. All right? Next example. We got g of x equals the square root of 25 minus x squared. Now with this, this is called a radical function because it contains a radical symbol. And with radical functions, we know that no matter what we have underneath, so this underneath the radical, I'm just going to write the word stuff because it's going to be stuff underneath there. I don't know what it is, but what I do know is this. This stuff has to be greater than or equal to zero. In other words, you cannot have negative numbers underneath a radical. Um, to Just to demonstrate this, just get out a calculator real quick, you know, and just say, okay, well, how about this? The square root of negative four. It's a non-real answer. You can't have that. Okay? It's a non-real result. It actually turns out to be a complex number, which is no longer in the real number system. So we need to be extremely careful. So we know underneath the radical, got to be greater than or equal to zero. So what we're going to do is we're going to take and this, this actually is a special name. It's called the radicand. 
If you don't remember that, it's called the radicand. So we're going to take that radicand and we're going to set it greater than or equal to zero. Now, to solve this, let's go ahead and let's add x squared to both sides because I hate when the x squared is negative. So we get 25 is greater than or equal to x squared. And the second thing I hate is the fact that the number is first and the variable is second. So I'm going to rewrite this as x squared is less than or equal to 25. To solve this, we're just going to go ahead and apply our square root property. And we're going to find that we get plus or minus 5, which we can just rewrite this as x is going to be in between negative 5 and 5 inclusively. Okay? So we can use the function. Oh, sorry, this was g of x. So we can use this function g of x, which is equal to the square root of 25 minus x squared, as long as as our values of x are in between negative 5 and positive 5 inclusively. Using set builder notation, you just literally just write out the double inequality and you can call it a day. All right. Now, the tricky part, okay, the tricky part here is what if you combine these? So find a domain for f of t, which is equal to t squared plus 1, all divided by the square root of t, let's say like this, the square root of 4t minus 1. Okay? So here we can see first we got a rational expression. So we definitely have a rational expression here. And we've got a square root in denominator. So that's going to kind of change things just a little bit. Okay. First, nobody cares about the numerator. We're allowed to have zero in the numerator, and that's okay. It's this denominator that we have to be concerned with. All right, it's this right here. So if we just focus on the denominator, here's what we know. First, we know we got a radical, which means the denominator itself on the surface, on the surface got to be greater than or equal to zero. However, since since the radical appears in the denominator, you could only have greater than, okay? Because remember, you're not allowed to have zero in that denominator, so we just kind of adjust what we need, okay? So what we're going to say here is 4t minus 1 is greater than zero. Now, from here, you could just go ahead and solve for t. By adding one to both sides, you get 4t, which is greater than 1. And then divide both sides by 4 to give you t is greater than 1 fourth. And this is your domain. Okay? So in set builder notation, you can say t is such that t is greater than 1 fourth. If you want an interval notation, you could say uh, from 1 fourth, comma, infinity. Because remember, you went greater than 1 fourth. All right? And that is kind of how we just find domains. Remember, the key is to think about what you were given first. All right, so I'm going to write that here. Key would be determine what type of function. Then identify any exceptions and just to recap you know if you got a fraction set denominator not equal to zero and solve 
if you have a radical. All right, so let me write, uh, I'll write the word radicand here. So if you have a radical, you're going to take your radicand greater than or equal to zero. And then the star would be if you have a fraction plus a radical in denominator. Then you're going to take your radicand and set it greater than zero. All right. Now, <clears throat> the last thing we're going to talk about here in, in this first uh, first uh, section here would just be ways to describe or ways to represent functions. OK, and there's basically four ways that we do this. The first way is verbally. I mean, you could write a sentence, OK, uh, describing a function. The second, which is probably the most common way that we, we refer to it, would be an algebraic expression or algebraic uh, function. Now, with this, this will be an explicit formula. And it doesn't mean a formula with bad words in it. What it means is that you're going to be finding f of x, and then on the right-hand side, Whatever this rule is that you're going to write is in terms of the variable x only. Meaning you're not going to see x and y or x, y, and z on the right-hand side. It will be strictly one variable. And that variable will match whatever the input is. The third way would be graphically and then the fourth way is numerically which means a table okay so I think a really easy one would be okay we've already looked at algebraically which is all the way up here so let me scroll all the way back up I think this right here would be a really good example. Of algebraically. So here's our highlighter. This is what we talk about when we say algebraically. Now. If I wanted to in blue. And I'm just going to erase this work here because we already have this. I could have also created a table. So here's my table. What you would do is you would put x in one column and then f of x equals x squared plus 1 in the second column. And all you would say is, well, we're evaluating this function for x equals negative 3 and x equals 0. f of x is going to be 10 and 1 respectively. And what you've just created right here are what we call ordered pairs. These are points on a graph. So you could say negative 3 comma 10 would be your first ordered pair. And then 0 comma 1 would be your second ordered pair. Now, if you wanted to do this function um, using words, you would write out the sentence. <laughs> you know, the function of x squared plus 1 evaluated. Like, you just write it out in words. I'm not going to do that because we never, ever do that, to be honest with you. But um, we can also do this graphically. And I'm going to go ahead and just pull out. My good old friend Desmos here for us. So let me open it up. All right. <clears throat> and within Desmos, um, you cannot use f of x as notation. So we just use the letter y. So we're going to say y equals x to the second power plus 1. <clears throat> and notice here, you just you have your function. It's quadratic. And what's really cool about Desmos is um, over where you typed in your function. So let me highlight here so you can see where I'm talking about over on the left hand side. In the upper right hand corner, you're going to see that little settings wheel. It says edit list. If you just click on edit list, all right, you can come up with convert to table. And just by clicking on convert to table, you already have some values here listed. And you can always change these if you wanted to. So for example, we could say negative 3 
And when you hit negative three, notice on the right hand side, it says 10. Then we can hit zero and it says one. And then you can, like I said, you can change, you, you can try to predict anything you want. So let's evaluate this when X equals uh, 150. Well, when X equals 150, you get 22,501. When X equals negative 3.14, you get 10.8596 and so forth. I mean, you could do whatever you wanted here and it's just going to tell you what it is. Okay. So that is going to be it for this video. Sorry, it's a, it's a long one, but, uh, you know, we're learning about functions and it's really good to have a nice strong foundation when it comes to what functions are, how do they work? How do we evaluate and what values are we allowed to use? That's really what this section one was all about. So I'll just talk to you in the next video. Bye.